that we're going to talk about is the fact that... Uh, have you started the time, yeah? No, no, no. Yeah, yeah, no, started, no, yeah. no, no, before starting. Before Why? Start Why should we before start? This is your time. Be before starting... Okay, go on. Discuss the topic. Introduction. Discuss the topic. What, what do you want to talk about? So I am here to talk about the differences between Islamic slavery and slavery as recorded in scriptures. <laughs> uh, theologically, the Bible rejects slavery. Okay. And therefore, those who read the Bible the Old, the Old Testament and the New Testament, yeah? Both. Okay. Reject slavery. Okay, that's going to be those, quite easy then. Those, those, those who read the Bible right. could... No problem, I understand, I understand the topic. Reject the Bible. I understand, I understand reject, the topic. Reject is, uh, slavery. I understand but the topic. In contrast, in regards to Islam... Right, can we get your time started then? Because we understand the topic. What's the topic? The topic is slavery, right? And the biblical slash Quranic view of it, right? Yeah. I guess I four, view, four minutes guess I. Do you agree with Islamic slavery? No, I'm happy with the topic, we'll yes. But do you agree? No, no give him four minutes. No, no, don't ask me questions. No, no. You wanna start? You got your four do minutes you, start? You, no, 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 don't ask me questions. No, 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 no. The, the, topic, the topic is fine. What is the topic? The topic is slavery in the Bib in the Bible and the Quran. That's do you want not a topic? I'm proposition. Yes, it is what a topic. is the proposition? That is that's what you said, and I'm happy with it. The proposition. Are you happy with that? The proposition. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Islam. Yeah continues to have slavery okay, no problem. underpinning uh, its theology. Okay, I disagree with it. If you're talking about Good. human to human slavery, not God to human, right? Is that what you mean? Human to human slavery. Fine, yeah. no problem. I'm against that proposition. Okay, okay. so All that's right, so, what we're talking about. And also we're talking about the Bible, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. Now? Four minutes, okay. go ahead, please. Do you want to go first? No, you oh, go no, first, no, sir. You want to start now? No, no, one second. Four minutes, okay. Four minutes. Can you buy Sorry, me a bit, Grim? No, 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 wait. Brother, you oh, buy it yourself. Right, I'm going to look away. Let's, 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 let's focus on the big topics and then we'll talk about these things okay. later. Okay, All right. Go ahead. Four minutes now. Go ahead. Okay. Islam approves of Islamic slavery. And therefore, even until today, even until today, there is no theological basis to reject slavery according to Islam. Why does Islam propagate slavery? Point number one. Muhammad himself and the wider religion has a derogatory view on a few different people groups. Number one, black people. Number two, unbelievers. And uh, especially women. A very derogatory view. And this resulted in harsh dealing by people including Muhammad himself of slaves. Harsh punishments, harsh dealing with slaves. Slaves had, were tortured, sex torture for female slaves. Slaves had no rights and uh, slaves had perpetual slavery, no legal rights, no civil rights. They were treated as merchandise and so on. According to Islam, there was no intention to manumit, i.e. to abolish slavery. Muhammad himself allowed Islamic slavery to be propagated until perpetuity. So Islam is a very bad model for today because according to Islam, Islamic slavery is still a valid model to be practiced and will be practiced even till the end of times. In contrast, when we come to the Bible, the Bible considers every human being to be similar. When we compare the Bible, Jesus Christ with Muhammad, we see someone who is well fitting into the 21st century model where we hate racism, where we hate slavery. So Jesus Christ is the only person that needs to be followed in terms of um, our modern views of slavery, abolishing of slavery and um, our modern views on the fact of human beings being similar. Muhammad is not a good example for people of today and therefore Muhammad ought to be rejected. So in particular, I'd like to ask the question to Muhammad who is here. Muhammad, the so-called Islamic prophet, approves of having sex with captives captive women at will by Muslims. Do you think that's a very good model 
for today to practice. When Muslims go to capture non-Muslims, do you think Muslims should have the ability and the permission from Muhammad and the Islamic Allah to have sex with captive women at all times, anytime they want to? And do you agree with that principle? Do you think that upholds human values properly? Uh, okay, go on. <laughs> okay. Go for a second. Go for a second. No, that's very go confident. On. It's very okay. confident. <laughs> Thank you for joining the Sunday sparring sessions with subpar opponents like this man here, who clearly is not um, articulate enough and hasn't used enough evidences from the Quran or Sunnah. In fact, if I recall, he hasn't used any evidence at all. He, did, he had papers in his hand, but he didn't even quote a single verse from the Quran or a single hadith. Unfortunately, today, what I will be doing is the opposite of that without the papers in my hand. So the Quran states something which refutes almost everything he states, which is in chapter 90 of the Quran, where it says, What would make you know what the good way is? Freeing slaves is the good way. So the idea that the manumission of slaves or the emancipatory discourse was that which is not mentioned in the Quran, but in fact the opposite of is mentioned, is something directly refuted in the Quranic discourse. Now this verse, is not an abrogated verse. Now I would like to know how my friend here has an answer for this verse. But not only this, we find in the Quran, in chapter 9, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he mentions the categories of zakat, which is, as you know, one of the five pillars of Islam. There are five pillars of Islam. I can teach you the basics in, uh, some other time. One of them is zakat, <laughs> the charity. And so one of the, one of the categories of charity is riqab, and freeing slaves. So here you have two things. You have an emancipatory discourse in chapter 90, Surah Al-Balad. And then you have the Quran saying one of the obligations, which is zakat, you have to spend the money to emancipate slaves. And then we have all of these ahadith of the Prophet Muhammad telling us of the virtue of freeing slaves. Now, this already has refuted almost everything that he has said. Let's move to the Bible now for a nice discussion about Numbers chapter number 31, verse number 18, which of course is going to be a difficult verse for my honorable friends. And of course, I use the term loosely here to explain where Moses is told to go into go into the uh, to the town and he is take the young girls for yourself now what young girls is he talking about here when you look at the Babylonian Talmud which is actually exegetes this particular verse it's talking about prepubescent girls so Moses is being instructed to take prepubescent girls for yourself to, for as a captives now the idea is this I want to know of a single verse of the Quran or a single hadith where prepubescent girls are told to be taken as captives in this manner in fact not only this but if they believe that uh, they believe that Jesus is God because he is part of the Trinity and therefore he's actually the author of the Old Testament as well isn't he because he's God and he's inseparable from the rest of the Trinity right so of course you have a double problem here. Jesus Christ, therefore, is the one that is commanding Moses to go and take captives, which are girls, for himself in chapter 31, verse 18 of Numbers. So this refutes the secondary claim that he had, that Jesus was completely disassociated from these slaves. So you have two things here. You have a complete refutation of the fact that there's not an emancipatory discourse in the Quran, which there is. And then you have a charge which I'm putting forward to the subpar opponent who will have no tools of being able to answer this question. That number one was Moses being commanded to take uh, slaves, but also that Jesus commanded this as well. Your turn, your turn. All right, so Muhammad here, calls me subpar, but, the bo but both the points he raised are really subpar. Let's look at both of them carefully. What happened in the book of Numbers? Read the verse carefully. The context corresponds to Moabites. 
You might have heard about a person called Balaam acting on behalf of the Moabites, leading the nation of Israel to sexual immorality and thereby allowing Balaam to be able to curse the nation of Israel. That's the historical context. Yeah. People who were involved in sexual immorality. In that, with that as the backdrop, what Moses said, Muhammad, of course. If they, you need to read the verse carefully. It wasn't talking about pre-puberty. -pre -puber Nothing about adolescence or puberty is discussed. If you read the verse carefully, all that it would not talk about is girls or ladies who did not have intimacy with men. What was he talking about? What he was talking about was those who did not lead you to sexual immorality. Those kinds of girls, I challenge Muhammad, why did you mention puberty? You need to show me that from the Bible. Why in the Bible talks about intimacy? Number one, number two, the Bible went, show to me where these ladies were taken as captives. Read the Bible carefully. What you would find is that everyone else were wiped out, whereas these were allowed to live along with the nation of Israel. That is what you would find. So find one example from the Bible, from the Bible, anywhere old, new, anywhere you want to go to, Muhammad, and find at the end of the war where women are taken as captive to be held as slaves. Find one example and then let's talk about facts. The problem is this, Muhammad is a Muslim and therefore clearly he is going to have his issues with his eyes. The problem anywhere, everywhere, whatever he reads, he is going to read Islam into it. Why do I say he is reading Islam into biblical verses? Nowhere in the Bible you would see these women being taken as captives and made, made slaves to the people. You don't find that in the Bible, yet he reads that. And the reason for that is Muhammad allowed slavery to be to continue until the end of his life. Sahih al-Bukhari, you say slavery, uh, slaves were manumitted and that's one of the five pillars. Sahih al-Bukhari disagrees with you. Chapter 3, uh, uh, verse, uh, 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 saying 765. 765, Sahih al-Bukhari 3, 765. Narrated Turib, the free slave, the free slave of Ibn Abbas. That Maimuna bin Al Harith told him that she manumitted a slave slave girl without taking the permission of the Prophet. A person comes to Muhammad and she says, I have manumitted a slave. The great Islamic Allah, who he thinks uh, uh, allowed Islamic Prophet to manumit slaves, do you know what he says? He says, Why did you do it? Why did you let her go? Whereas the Bible dislikes. The idea of people being taken as captive slaves, women especially, Mohammedia goes on to say, you would have got more reward if you had given her to one of your maternal uncles. So the idea that Islamic, the so-called prophet called Mohammed, implemented manumission of slaves is a fantasy idea, doesn't correspond to reality. Let me ask you this, Mohammed. Time's finished. All right. Well, thank you for uh, for that. Unfortunately, you haven't done a good job in answering my interrogation. Actually, the verse says, "Take the little ones for yourself." This is chapter thirty-one, verse eighteen of Numbers. Take them for yourself. And if you're saying this doesn't imply captivity, if you're saying this does not imply captivity, then you will be going against all halakhic understandings by the Jewish people who have been interpreting this for, for decades, in fact, actually millennia. And I will say to you once again, go back to the Je Jerusalem Talmud. There's two Talmuds, the Babylonian one and the Jerusalem one. Go and see what the rabbis have said in, re in relation to this verse. They clearly understood it to mean captivity. Okay, you don't like this verse. Let's go to 1 Samuel chapter, five, uh, chapter 15, verse 2, where it talks about going the way of the Amalekites and don't leave... Don't leave anything alive, uh, and uh, even the donkey. Uh, women, children, and even the donkey. And in other places it says, kill everything. So actually, the injunctions in, in, in Numbers chapter 31, verse 18, are a step down, even though they mean captivity for women, 
they're a step down from what we find in 1 Samuel 15. Because in 1 Samuel 15, we see everybody's genocided and everybody's killed. And once again, we have to bring to the intention of the Christian community that you may say this is the Old Testament and it's something we don't want to associate with. But if you believe that Jesus is inseparable from the Trinity, then you believe that he was the author of the Old Testament, which means that at least at one point in time, he must have ordered Moses to do those genocides and kill those children and kill those animals. This is clear. And this is the understanding of the rabbis. And this is the understanding, quite frankly, of even uh, reformers, theologians like John Calvin, who exegeted the Bible. Look at how people exegeted the Bible away from this pathetic apologism that you're finding here from these people. You'll find that it's a consistent theme, that they understood it in the way of genocide and captivity and slavery. In fact, racial slavery, which he had the audacity to accuse our prophet of, despite the fact that he is the only man, and Islam is the only religion which categorically forbids racism. And I say that to you, get me one verse of the Bible, which has the equivalent of saying racism is wrong, I can get you a hadith straight away. That there's no virtue over an Arab, over a non-Arab, or a black man over a white man. And that the best of you are those most in virtue. Get me the equivalent of that in the Bible. We find the opposite in the Bible. Genesis chapter 9, verse number 22, we find the curse of Ham. Noah had three sons. And the biblical exegete said the curse of Ham was that he was cursed with black skin, curly hair and slavery. And you see now that, that, that those who, who justify slavery in the transatlantic slave trade, obviously some use the Bible to, to I will be honest, to attack uh, slavery as well. But for the majority of those who propagated slavery, use this curse of Ham as a uh, justification. You can't come to me and talk about slavery. You can't come to me and talk about racism. Because the Bible, there is nothing in the Bible that forbids racism. We have Jesus Christ. Is it time? 20, 20 seconds. 20 seconds. We have Jesus Christ. To, in, the, in the New Testament, we have Jesus Christ shunning, shunning the Gentile woman and calling her of the dogs. This is racism with all due respect. She's, she's a dog because she's not a Jew. So here we find, my challenge is very clear. One verse of the Bible which categorically rejects slavery. And how do you deal with those verses that I told you in chapter 90 and chapter 9? Yep. Mohammed Ijab should get to know the topic first clearly. If you're going to talk about genocide as the Bible advocate, we can get to that later. The point is pretty simple, Mohammed. If you want to listen here, the point is pretty simple. The entire narration of the nation of Israel was about God redeeming a people group who were slaves, oppressed slaves, redeeming them and giving them liberty is the entire Old Testament, the beginning of the Old Testament. And Exodus chapter 22, verse 21, soon after God brings them out, this is what he says, not to mistreat a stranger or oppress him because you were strangers in Egypt. The challenge that I had for you is very simple, Mohammed. Find one evidence. Read to me one evidence where you find people who are brought under captivity and made slaves to live with Israel, to be slaves with Israel. You won't be able to find. In contrast, what you would find is that in the Bible, you find God advocate similar law for foreigners and for the nation of Israel. God forbidding, God forbidding kidnapping, i.e. taking a person against his will, whether it against his will and bringing, in, bringing him under captivity. You find people given rights, legal rights given to those who are working in Egypt. Exodus 21, 21, 22, 21. Not to mistreat a stranger or oppress him. No unfair treatment, no forced marriage. Jesus says, there is neither, New Testament says, Galatians 3, 28, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Excuse me, one second. There is neither male nor female. So if you go through the Bible, the entire story about the Bible is redemption of slaves 
and uh, people being me ma uh, made to live as free human beings only with obligation under god in contrast what do you find in contrast you find muhammad you are free excuse me in contrast you find muhammad having deep racism muhammad thinking two black people muhammad are equal to one arab slave sahi muslim 10 3901 sahi al bukhari 9 892 the black people were raised in heads muhammad himself owned black slaves sahi muslim 10 3901 52334 al tabari talking about black slavery explaining it as uh, as the africans having come from ham and therefore ought to be enslaved tirmidhi hadith 38 muhammad says when allah created adam he struck his right shoulder and took out a black race as if they were calls then he said to those who were on this right side toward paradise and i don't care he said to those who were on his left shoulder towards hell and i don't care that what you find here is mohammed saying all black people are destined to go to hell and he doesn't even care about this that's quite not just this mohammed also considered anyone who is not a muslim to be like cattle like pigs like sheep cows camels and therefore no wonder you find in islam very evil treatment of unbelievers non muslims when they are caught during a war what happens to them they are taken females are taken as sex slaves quran surah 4 ayah 3 surah 4 ayah 24 time finish we'll get to 4 3 in the next well you want to his mic all right so could yeah, you, could you, is, he, is he with you Could you please ask him not to disturb no, 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 in the no. middle of yeah no one in the sir. middle of I, no one's with me here today everyone's coming from their own homes ready all right so he wanted something on the bible i gave him uh, i gave him Deuteronomy uh, sorry i gave him you can go to Deuteronomy as well chapter 21 that's something that or you can also go to numbers 31 uh, 18 and you can go to first samuels and the reason why i was mentioning genocide was because if the bible the biblical commandment was to kill the people enslaving them is one notch below that so It doesn't make sense to talk about morality when you're talking about going into an entire village of Amalekites and destroying and killing the entire population, not leaving even the animals to be alive. There is no such injunction that you will find anywhere in the Quran. And I once again challenge you to find me a single verse or a single hadith to that effect. Now, you wanted to, you want, pardon? 21. Yeah, no, it's not 21. Get it. Yeah, so now the, 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 let's quickly talk about what he talked about. The hadiths that he mentioned were false. That the black people on the right and the left. This is not, the word used in that hadith was not black. The word was dark. And this is in the Quran, wujuhum muswadda, that they will have darkened faces. And in fact, ironically, this kind of language is used when men use, when men practice something called infanticide, when they kill daughters that are, are girls, that that their faces will be darkened and so on and there's a reprimand in the Quran for that it doesn't mean that it's talking about the race and he talks about two black people be, uh, being the thing for one how is that the case when Bilal ibn Rabah was bought by Abu Bakr Siddiq for a high price very very high price and then when he was told afterwards he said I would have paid even more for him so this is nonsense what you're talking about Bilal ibn Rabah which everyone knows who he is married Hala bin Tawf who was an Arab and he became the Mu'addin of the higher echelons of, of that particular Islamic society. There was no mention of his race in the derogatory way whatsoever. In fact, we have a narration where Bilal was actually abused by Abu Dhar al-Ghifari because he said to him that you are the son of a black woman. The Prophet got angry and he responded by saying, what have you said and, and reprimanded him and told him not to say such a thing. So all of what you're, what you're uh, doing is distorting and completely decontextualizing that which is correct. You haven't actually had any response for that which I've mentioned, which is that Jesus Christ, who is meant to be inseparable from the body of the Trinity, he is inseparable from the Trinity. He is the one who commanded to, uh, to genocide and to enslave. You'll find in Numbers 31.18, you'll find in Deuteronomy chapter 21.10, you'll find in uh, uh, first, uh, 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 first Samuel chapter 15 verse 2. And, and this, look, you find here, whoever strikes, Uh, whoever strikes 
his male or female servant. This is Exodus chapter 21, verse 20. Whoever strikes his male or female servant with a staff, and if they have died by his hands, he shall be guilty of a crime. But if he survives for one day or two, he shall not be subject to punishment because it is his money. Is his you see, if he, if he beats him so badly, he beats him so badly that he doesn't survive, that he survives, he doesn't get any crime because it is his money. This is the, this is the heart of objectification, of commodification, of all the things that you're accusing Islam of. You have no answer, my friend, to the emancipatory discourse that we find in uh, Surah Al-Bala, uh, chapter number 90, and the fact that uh, freeing slaves was something which is in the zakat, obligatory. Also, you'll find in chapter number 24, verse 33, that it's mentioned mukataba. And mukataba is the idea of somebody comes who is enslaved, and according to one opinion, according to uh, Tafsir al-Qurtubi, that they have to be freed. If they say we don't want to, we want to ransom ourselves, they're enslaved. So in other words, the, the so-called um, uh, master, you have to be freed, so that's another thing you can bring. Time, time, time. Go ahead. <coughs> All right, Muhammad is repeating his same erroneous points again. Who is Muhammad Hijab? Let's ask that simple question. His own scholar, Islamic scholar says, Muhammad Hijab is an infidel. Why do I say this? Because his own Islamic scholar, Sheikh Saleh Al Fawzan says slavery is part of Islam. Slavery is part of Islam. Slavery is part of jihad. And jihad will remain as long as there is Islam. So slavery is part of Islam. Slavery is part of jihad. And jihad will remain as long as there is Islam. And he goes on to say, he goes on to say, there are ignorant people like Muhammad Hijab here who think slavery, Islamic slavery has been abolished are ignorant. They are not scholars. He said that people who express such opinions, they are merely writers. Whoever says such things, is an infidel. Why does Muhammad Hijab say what he says at Hyde Park? Because he knows he can't say what this gentleman said from Saudi Arabia in a nation like ours. He knows it. If he says what he says from Saudi Arabia, he knows Islam would not spread even the tiny little bit it is attempting to do now. And that is why he doesn't do it. And that is why the Saudi Arabian Sheikh calls him an infidel. What do we find? He said Bilal was a black guy and treated with great respect. Bilal said to Abu Bakr, my dear friend Sahih al-Bukhari says, 557.99 it says, Bilal, even up to the time of Abu Bakr, remained a slave. And that is very important for you to know. I don't care what he did. I don't care if he called people to pray. I don't care if he sung a few songs or any of those things. The question is, yeah. how did Muhammad treat him? Yeah, yeah. Muhammad yeah, treated know. Bilal as a slave. Okay. So continued Abu Bakr. Muhammad was quite happy with this. Okay. He was quite happy with slaves, continuing as slaves until the end of Islam, which is the end of times according to Islam, according to Muhammad, okay. hijab and any other knowledgeable Muslim. So the problem is this. Yeah. In Islam, blacks, unbelievers, especially women, are treated in a bad way. They're seen as cattle, pigs, all sorts of derogatory terms. This resulted in harsh treatments of sex torture. Female slaves were tortured. Quran Surah 4.24, Quran Surah 4, verse 3, Fura 4, Surah 4, Ayah 29, and so on. Please answer. Muhammad, if the Quran says that Muslims can take any of the captive women who their right hands possess and have sex with them at any stage, uh, in the, uh, any stage, do you agree with this? If you had a wife who is a non-Muslim and if Muslims were to get hold of her and say, she is my captive, I can do what I want to do with her, will you be happy? I'm assuming you won't be. And therefore, you need to agree, Islam does terrible things with uh, slaves. Like I said earlier, Bilal, manumission, 
a great one of five pillars according to Mohammed. The problem, like I said earlier, Surah Sahih Al Bukhari 3765, Sahih Al Bukhari 557.99. Both of them are against this. Slaves were asked to continue as slaves. All right, let's one more each, huh? We don't want to spend them like another yeah, two yeah, hours. Yeah, yeah. I think it's I think it's settled after one. You you I'm gonna have, say this again. I have one, then you have one, and then I finish because you started, okay? Yes. So, so yeah. Uh, so you. Yeah. I'm gonna speak, then you, then I conclude, and then that's it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Was that two rounds each? No, one, one more. Right. Yeah, so four twenty four. Well, muasanatu min al nisa illa ma malakat aymanukum. Where does it say you can have sex with slaves at any time and all the stuff that you're talking about? It doesn't say that at all. All it says is that you're not allowed to marry a woman who's married except what your right hand possesses. What your right hand possesses doesn't mean that you can have sex with them whenever you want. In fact, the idea of raping a woman, whether she is a slave or whether she's a wife, has been spoken about by the Salaf of this Ummah or the predecessors. As Shafi'i mentions it in Kitab al-Umm, even Imam Malik mentions it, and the punishment of it is a corporal punishment, something like whipping and so on and so forth. So this is not something that Islam endorses at all. And the evidence of that is the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad where he says, la darar wa la dirar. You can't harm or reciprocate harm. How can you rape a woman, whoever she may be, in Islam without causing harm? So this is something that is completely falsehood, and it's, it is a, is a projection that he has of his own religion onto mine. Because the truth of the matter is, what we've said today is number one, you have the verse in Numbers 31.18. We have Deuteronomy 21.10. We have, we have Exodus that we've spoken about. We have, we, we've, talk, we've spoken about, and there's other verses. There are so many of them that I can't even enumerate them in the short space that I have today. They have been understood by biblical commentators, both Jewish and Christian, a full time including those writers of the Jerusalem Talmud and others as meaning captivity and genocide. And that's why the sophisticated theologians of the 21st century and even the 20th century admit this candidly. They admit this candidly and therefore they make some excuse to disband in the Old Testament and they try and pretend as if it doesn't exist. The truth of the matter is, if you believe Jesus is God, then he is inseparable from the Old Testament authorship, which means he is the one who commanded Moses to do all of those things. Yeah. If he is the God, he is the one who commanded the people to genocide. He is the one who commanded the people to enslave and so on and so forth. He is the one who said, he is your money when, it's, when it comes to beating and abusing the slaves and so on and so forth. These verses have had no good response today. Bilal did not remain a slave for all of Islam. This is a falsehood. In fact, that's impossible. He married Hala bin Ta'uf and he gave her a mahar and she was a free woman and she, he was a free man. This was absolutely established in the Sunnah and he had children with her. And those children were in fact half white, half black, half Arab. Nobody ostracized him except that they would meet the reprimand of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as in the case of Abu Dhar al-Ghafari in the well-known hadith. So therefore, this notion that Islam is a racist religion is something you cannot substantiate. Moreover, moreover, it's something you will not be able to find in the Bible a single verse which has condemnatory tone or an explicit remark relating to racism being a bad thing. So what, do, what have we established today? The number one, the Quran has an emancipatory discourse as mentioned in chapter 90 and as mentioned in the in Surah Tawbah and as mentioned in chapter 24 verse 33 we have mentioned that there are opinions of the Salaf that say that a slave can literally force themselves out of slavery through ransom it's called Mukataba that give them Mukataba ransom if they know good if, if you know good in them and according to a Qurtubi that some Salaf said this is by way of wujub, which means it's obligatory, even if the slave master didn't want it, which is, if this opinion is respected, as good as abolition. This is as good as abolition. If this opinion is not respected, then it's not. He talked about Shaykh, uh, Salah al-Fawzan, I'll mention that in the conclusion. Um, yes, sir. Okay, all Muslims have a very important question to ask today. On the one hand, you have the Bible. 
The claim is made that Islam and the Bible, New Testament and the Old Testament are Abrahamic in origin. But what we find are clear differences in the Bible. We don't talk about racism. We don't talk about abolishing of in the way that he wants them to be spoken of because the Bible never had slavery like what Islam ever had. What you find in the Bible is the story of God empathizing with slaves, the nation of Israel, redeeming them and leading them on to uh, freedom. This is the story asked. And on the back of that, God of the Bible says, Exodus 22, 21, he says, not to mistreat a stranger or oppress him because you yourselves were strangers in Egypt. So across the Bible, what you find is God of the Bible demanding fair treatment of everyone, regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, language spoken and so on. And God is seen as God who is impartial in the Bible. And I asked Muhammad multiple times, can you show me a place where women are taken, are taken as sex captives? And he couldn't show that. All that he's talking about are a few places where there, were, there was political war <coughs> and entire people groups were asked to be wiped out by God. Now God, my God, God of the Bible judges. If he has a problem with that, well, I can only say judgment is coming. And a few of these judgments came in the past, Amalekites and so on. Judgments came. In contrast, what do you find, what do you find in Islam? In Islam, Islam clearly says that the black people are not worth as much as the Arabs. One black guy, one Arab guy is worth twi two, two black guys. Black people are like raisin heads, unbelievers are like cattle and so on. And this resulted in very harsh treatments, sex torture of female slaves, find in uh, various portions of the Hadith and Quran 43, 424, um, Surah Al Kubra 2227, and so on. Multiple places you find sex torture of female slaves, Umar torturing female slaves. No rights being given. Quran, Quran Surah 16, Ayah 75 says, Slaves control nothing. No right whatsoever. And that free men cannot be punished for the murder of a slave. Quran Surah 2, Ayah 178. Also repeated in Tafsir Jalalin. So the point is, torture of sex slaves. No rights. Free men are not equal to the slaves. So clearly no equal treatment. And this therefore resulted in Muhammad not permitting or not allowing manumission to happen. Sahih al-Bukhari 557-99-3765. You find Bilal continuing as a slave. If Bilal says this to Abu Bakr, if you have bought me for yourself, Sahih al-Bukhari 557-99. If you have bought me for yourself, then keep me for yourself. But if you bought me for Allah's sake, then leave me for Allah's work. He is pleading. This great guy, who is the one who calls people to pray for prayer, he is pleading. If you have bought me for the sake of Allah, leave me alone. But you are still keeping me as a slave. So Muhammad continuing to keep people as slaves. Sahih al-Bukhari 3, 765, 5, 5, 41 and so on. Slaves working for Muhammad. Time, time, time. You know, he said that the Quran says that disbelievers are like cattle. It doesn't say that. It says, Belhum illa kal an'ami. Belhum adallu sabila. That they are like cattle. No, no, no. They are more astray than the cattle. And as we've seen today, <laughs> worse than cattle. Ah, as we've seen worse today, than cattle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? As we've cattle seen today, when the truth. Okay, be quiet now, please. Don't waste my time. As we've seen today, everybody, we have seen today that that is the case. You're presented with straight facts and you cannot maneuver away from them. You cannot circumnavigate them. You cannot deal with them. You cannot hermeneutically, acrobatically, gymnastically get away from them and the reality of the situation is you're dealt with the blunt truth in front of your face as clear as the day and you're just scurrying scared and absolutely anxious that someone like me without a paper in my hand knowing your scriptures more than you and knowing my scriptures more than you'll ever know dealing with you in the way that i've dealt with you the truth of the matter is i'll own
العبد بالعبد وال الحر بالحر والعبد بالعبد والانثى بالانثى it was, was actually abrogated chapter 2 verse 178 was was abrogated with the ayat in surah al-maida where it talks about العين بالعين which is talking an eye for an eye number 1 so that's and, and it wasn't what he thought it meant anyway but it was abrogated in either event number 1 point number 2 Point number two, you keep mentioning Bilal. Yeah. Bilal was not a slave when he married Hala bint Auf. He was not a slave when he was literally ascending the Kaaba, telling the people, I'm in charge now, re reciting the call to prayer in front of all the Arabs who are literally below him in, 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 in physical stature. Yeah. How dare you talk about Bilal in that manner when the Prophet said he will be the one, he can hear his footsteps in Jannah. The things that he said about the things that he said about all the hadiths about black people being in hell, every single one of them is false. None of those hadiths use the word black. None of them. In fact, like I said, the opposite is true. We have explicit statements from the Prophet saying there's no virtue over a black man over a white man or a white man over a black man, an Arab over a non-Arab. There is no such statement in the Bible. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, we find these genocides of the Amalekites who he admits it to. He says this is them asking for it, basically. We want to be destroyed. No, no one asked for genocide, sorry to say. This is the kind of kalam that we find the Israelis doing with the Palestinians. Inspired by that horrible Old Testament narrative. Moreover now, let's be honest. Let's be honest and say that even the New Testament, Jesus calling a non-Jewish person a dog. Yes, at the end of it, he said, okay, I'll give you whatever you want. But he still called her a dog because she was a Gentile. That's racism. Your book is fraught, saturated, filled, contaminated, polluted. It is seeping, brimming with racism, brimming with genocide, brimming with racism. You need us, my friend. You don't, we don't need anything from you. You come to us and you ask us, why was everything abrogated in the way it was? Because the Prophet Muhammad eliminated racism, the only person in his time to do so. And it was the only emancipatory discourse of any Abrahamic religion in the world that is Islam. Come to it and stop being arrogant. All right, thank you very much, Muhammad.